As we come to look at God's word together, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for each day that you give us to live this life. And we thank you especially for the new life that we have as we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this morning that you would help us to appreciate more of the wonder of this and that you would help us to see that the Lord Jesus Christ is the person, the Saviour, the King that others need to put their trust in this world. We pray this in his name. Amen. I wonder if you've been talking to someone and they've said that it would be great uh, if God did a miracle that they could witness or see, that God might give them a sign, uh, and in the conversation it's it's clear that the reason they're asking this is because perhaps then they'll become a Christian and follow Lord Jesus. Uh, or perhaps you've talked to someone and they've said, uh, well, I, I would believe, um, but why doesn't God send Jesus? Uh, if I saw Jesus, then I might believe that what you're saying is true. Well, we've begun a series in John's Gospel, and as you remember, John tells us the purpose for which he wrote his Gospel in John chapter 20 and verse 30. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so in John's Gospel, John concentrates on a number of key signs, uh, key miracles that Jesus performs and the, the claims and the teaching that Jesus gives surrounding those particular events to bear witness to the fact of who Jesus is and why he's the one we need to trust in to have eternal life to have a right relationship with God, to know the blessings of God now and forever. And so as we read John's Gospel, we're actually getting the, the eyewitness testimony of some of the key miracles that Jesus did. But John also tells us right at the end of his Gospel, at the end of chapter 21, that if, uh, he, uh, if all the miracles and things that Jesus did were written down then it would be hard to contain uh, in all the books that would be written and if you think about the detail that John gives us about particularly seven signs uh, then you can understand when you read the Gospels and it talks about just the amount of people that were coming to Jesus and the, the people that he helped and the miracles that he did and the teaching that he gave most often not given in summary form in the Gospels then indeed it would, would cover a lot of material if it was all recorded. And this is the first sign that John tells us Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. And it was there that the disciples saw his glory. Uh, they started to see something of the majesty, the power and the person of Jesus. The first thing that we noticed in the passage that we looked at and was read this morning is that it, it tells us about what the Lord's doing. Uh, you remember that John the Baptist in chapter 1 had said he was the forerunner, he was the preparer that Isaiah spoke about in Isaiah 40, preparing the way of the Lord. And now we see Jesus as the Lord doing the work that only God can do. And he's showing his character in his family's countryside, in, in the region around where his family lived. As the, the promised servant that Isaiah goes on to talk about, who alone will provide the blessing of the new creation. And so we see Jesus is at this wedding with his family, uh, with his mother uh, and probably his brothers, who were spoken of later. Uh, probably at this time Joseph has died, being a little bit older. And so Jesus is actually the one that Mary 
naturally turns to if she needs some assistance on an occasion like this. So we're told in verse 2 that Jesus was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And we've met some of his first disciples in chapter 1. People like Andrew and Peter. People like Nathaniel. People like Philip. Who have already started to follow him and who lived in the similar local region. Now in our culture, despite all the attacks on marriage uh, as defined in the Bible and the more recent utter confusion and chaos about what marriage actually means, uh, it's still marked, isn't it, in our culture with some sort of special occasion and great expectation. If someone's getting married and there's a wedding, it's a, it's a notable event. And in some sense, it's noted because it's expressing the blessings of living in this world uh, of sharing the closest of relationships that often grows with the on advent of, of children coming along. Well, marriage was certainly prized in the Jewish culture and the preparations and the provisions required for such an event were considerable. And it seems that Mary was involved in some sense. Perhaps she knew the people quite well. She certainly got her eye on what's happening and she hears about the fact that the wine's run out. Uh, Cain is not far from Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. And Mary certainly hasn't any qualms about asking Jesus to solve the problem. Uh, but there's no indication that she's expecting a miracle. But she asks Jesus for help. Now, wine was a key ingredient to any celebration like this. It was a staple crop of, of Israel. You'll remember that the, the, the early spies, when Joshua and Caleb, among them, went into the land to spy out the land in the book of Numbers, uh, one of the things they brought back was a whole big branch of grapes. And they said, this is the type of fruit that's in the land. It was meant to uh, show forth the the agricultural uh, wealth and provision in the land of Israel. And so wine was a, a, was a staple drink that was used in everyday life uh, and it was something that was part of the celebrations and it was certainly something that you didn't want running out in the middle of what was typically a, a week-long event at a wedding. But that's what happened. Uh, the wine ran out. Jesus, we're told, told the servants to fill the water jars, the six water jars with water. And we're told that uh, that was about two to three measures in volume, uh, around 76 to 114 litres in total. I just didn't do that off the top of my head then. Um, converting from gallons. Uh, so it's a lot, a lot of wine uh, that was needed and probably shows too that this family was quite well off. They did have servants. So it was a big occasion. But the focus turns to, of course, Jesus who now provides in the midst of this problem. And it's not simply the, the quantity that's required that Jesus supplies but also the quality. Because the, the wine that's drawn out of the jars is new wine, and it surprises the master of the feast. And he's wondering why the, the, the bridegroom uh, has now facilitated the new wine to come out uh, at this particular time in the celebrations. Jesus has provided in the most amazing way. He's turned water into wine. And he's done it to the most amazing extent. And it's a taste of who he is as the Lord coming into this world to establish God's kingdom of blessing, finally. And to do it in the complete way that provides perfectly for his people. Now John tells us it's the first sign that Jesus did in verse 11. 
at Cana in Galilee. It's where the disciples who also are aware that it's only Jesus who did this, whereas the general guests have no idea, that they see his glory. It's the first sign that Jesus is the Messiah, he's the Christ. Uh, he's God's anointed king. He's God's chosen king who, who rules with the very authority of God over creation. And that's what's required, isn't it? The, the power of the creator to turn water into wine. And you'll notice there that the, the, the water jars were jars meant for Israel's purification rites. And there's a little bit of a hint here that what Israel's purification rites could not do, Jesus has come to do. He has come to secure God's blessing for his people. Jesus is the true Son of God. Only he can do it. It might seem strange that this sign seems to be purposely hidden from a wider audience, but Jesus uh, preempted that, didn't he? Uh, in verse 4. When Mary comes to say to Jesus, they have no wine, he says, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. It might seem quite abrupt the way Jesus addresses his mother, but it shows, doesn't you, the, the complete focus that Jesus has on his mission. Uh, Jesus has come into this world not to simply... Uh, be told what to do by anyone in the world, not to simply uh, conform to any kind of program that people might want, as, as good as it may, may seem. Uh, he's come to actually go to fulfil what God said was necessary to establish his kingdom and to provide his new creation blessings. And a number of times through John's Gospel, Jesus says this type of phrase, my hour has not yet come. And later on, it's even Jesus' brothers who actually want him to display his glory publicly, and Jesus refuses. Again, showing that he's not going according to the timetable of other human beings, even those from his own family. And of course, still at that stage, they have a wrong idea of who Jesus is. They're still thinking in terms of a a physical, political saviour and messiah. But Jesus is going to go to the cross. That's when his hour will have come. And he tells us that in verse in chapter 12, as he looks ahead to his crucifixion. That's where his glory is going to be manifested supremely. Because that's when he's going to actually secure God's promised blessings for all who trust in him. So John tells us of this sign and he gives us a glimpse of who Jesus is and also the fact that Jesus is very aware of the mission that he's come to accomplish. It's a reminder, isn't it, that no other person can provide what Jesus provides in this world. Uh, no matter how long a religion has been around and its adherents have sought to practice it, even the Jews, the people of Israel, couldn't bring about God's kingdom. Even though they were called to display uh, the rule of God in the Old Testament, even though they were meant to, to live out God's purposes and display his character, they failed to do that themselves and they, of course, by extension, failed to show that to the nations. No matter how long an individual seeks to try and, and invoke or merit God's blessings, no matter how long a person can try and seek to gain a right relationship with God and to, to know his forgiveness, his reconciliation and the assurance of eternal life, they cannot do it by their own power and by their own means. Now, no matter how seriously a person has sought the assurance of forgiveness from their guilt and their shame or real freedom from the, 
the selfishness and the pride and the, the fear that grips us human beings. Uh, no one can actually provide the answer to those real problems and enter into God's family and enjoy the blessings of being an heir of God's rule forever. But in Jesus Christ, God has come, the Lord has come to provide this for everyone who will truly trust in him, who will truly submit to his rule, will recognise who he is, will worship him as the true God and the true Saviour. Remember John chapter 1, 10 to 12. I'll read from verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, who gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. As Jesus displays his glory to particular people in this instance, it's uh, an indication, isn't it, as we'll see particularly next week, uh, that Jesus understands that even the people who are seeing something of his glory, his disciples, his mother, his brothers, even when they see it, it's still a process by which they finally come to acknowledging who Jesus is and really understanding why their trust needs to be fully in him as the saviour going to the cross to save them. Jesus performs a sign that points to God's ultimate blessing and the Bible talks about this in terms of a wedding, doesn't it? A wedding feast of the lamb, the crucified saviour king. And it's that wedding feast in the book of Revelation, and, and Jesus talks about it too in, in Matthew's Gospel, which will be the, the ultimate end point, the final display and experience of God dwelling with his people in precisely the perfect way that he's promised from the beginning. The second incident that John records here is Jesus going to the temple in Jerusalem at the Passover time. And here again we're shown something of the, the work of the Lord, the work that only God can do, has the authority to do, showing his character, but not in the countryside, in the heart of Israel's capital. And Jesus again is showing he's the promised servant who alone will provide the blessing of the new creation. Verse 14, In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remember that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. At the heart of Israel's capital, Jerusalem, at the heart of the nation, at the, the heart of their identity and their purpose, was the temple. And this was the focus of God's special relationship with his people. Remember that special relationship had been begun in terms of a, a national group when God had brought the people out of Egypt under Moses. And that was when the Passover feast was first established. That was the, the feast that every household had to uh, participate in and therefore show their trust in as God's provision 
to escape the judgment that he was bringing on the land of Egypt of which they were a part. And it was the feast that God was going to uh, use to demonstrate as a sign that they were under his salvation and he would be their saviour, rescuing them from Egypt under Moses. Now God had manifested his presence to people right from Adam and Eve and on to, to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. But when he did bring the people out under Moses, of course, and brought them to Mount Sinai, uh, he established a tent of meeting where Moses would be and the people could come and they could interact with Moses as a mediator between them and God. Then the people were instructed to build a more substantial tabernacle, a, a portable temple, if you like, uh, very elaborate, but which they could take with them as they journeyed and they could set up every time they established a new camp. And it was always set up in the middle of the camp of all the tribes because it was the centre of relationship with God. And then, of course, when they finally came into the Promised Land and they, they conquered the nations and they established God's rule and David conquered Jerusalem, under Solomon, his son, a, a permanent structure was erected, a glorious temple that was meant to display the glory of God and his blessing upon the people of Israel and be a witness to the nations. And under Solomon's rule, of course, we see the nations starting to come in the form of some of the, the rulers like the Queen of Sheba or uh, Hiram of Tyre helping with the temple building itself. This was meant to represent the, the glory of God as the, the true king of creation and the only saviour who could provide people, sinful people, with a right relationship with him. But, but as magnificent as that elaborate structure was in the temple and as elaborate as the mechanism of the priesthood and the sacrifices and, and all the laws were, the people themselves and the kings also demonstrated that they were not fit to be God's people. And they couldn't provide by themselves relationship with God. They couldn't live up to and display the glory of God's character and purpose for his creation. All of these provisions were pointing forward to when God himself would provide everything that his people would need. Uh, in the history of Israel, God's just judgment came against them after their continued rebellion. And eventually that was shown not only in the destruction of Jerusalem, but the destruction of the temple. As people were exiled to Babylon, or killed and displaced from their land. And even though the people did return after the exile to the land and sought to rebuild the capital, sought to rebuild the temple. It never approached the physical glory, let alone the real spiritual glory that God was looking for to be represented amongst the people. Now in Jesus' day, uh, King Herod was undergoing another building program for the Jewish temple. And it had been going on for nearly 46 years. You can imagine how significant this building was. Uh, but Jesus says that destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Jesus is coming and he's actually exposing the darkness of sin that's present even within Israel. A darkness of sin that's right at the heart of how they're relating to God and thinking of God. And of course it's seen in the way that they're operating in the temple. Now at one level, uh, there was a need for money changes and for sacrifices to be sold because people weren't just coming from the nearby area to the temple. They would often travel great distances. And that means that they might have to exchange coinage uh, to buy sacrifices and they couldn't necessarily bring all the sacrifices with them. So from a practical point of view, uh, this 
seems quite um, understandable. But you'll notice, of course, that all this is taking place uh, within the temple, not outside the temple. And this is the big difference. And it was taking place in the very area where the Gentiles were meant to be engaging with God. And so what it reflects is the, the, the Jewish leaders and together with them, the people, establishing their own way of relating to God and saying, we're, we're going to establish the temple our way. Uh, we're going to define how we should relate to God. It will be on our terms. And that will include excluding, effectively, the worship of Gentiles who might want to come and acknowledge the true and living God. Completely opposed to God's purposes, completely opposite to his words and instructions in the Old Testament law. And so Jesus expresses God's righteous judgment upon the people in this sign as he clears the temple, showing that the people have no place there because they're seeking to approach God and to manifest how to approach God to others in completely the wrong way. And of course he shows just how far they, have, they are from God's true provision of right relationship with himself because their focus is on what they've been trying to establish in most recent history for 46 years. Their temple. Not God's temple. Jesus reminds them that they can, can't actually establish God's temple. Because he's that temple. He's God himself coming to this world as the person, the place through which people can only relate to God rightly. And why can they relate to God rightly through Jesus? Not only because he's the, the God man, uh, God in the flesh, but because as God in the flesh, he's the one who provides the sacrifice by which anyone can approach God and must approach God through his death and resurrection. Notice what Jesus says in verse 16. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. See, the temple, the true temple, was not Israel's temple. It was the father's temple. The true temple was the son. And God is giving his son to provide for and to point to the only way sinful people can have access to God, can have their sins forgiven, and can experience the blessings of the Holy Creator. This is the second sign that John highlights, and he unmasks the focus and reliance upon the temple in Israel, and reveals that he alone is the place, the person in whom is found right relationship with God. So again, it doesn't matter how long the whole nation, even with the Jewish heritage, had strived to provide and promote and display the glory of their temple. Only Jesus was God's true temple. Only he could provide what they needed to enter into God's kingdom blessings forever. Uh, what Israel's leaders had corrupted by their own nationalism with a focus on them themselves as the, the children of Abraham, and this will come out further in John's Gospel later, to the exclusion of others that God also wanted to come into his kingdom. Jesus is showing that he's coming to this world to overthrow this, this human scheme, this human-centred scheme. And it's going to be for the benefit of those who are really seeking salvation in Israel, as well as 
all the nations who need God's salvation. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, John said, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the phrase dwelt among us really takes that expression that the tabernacle of God being with his people now seen perfected, glorified in the coming of Jesus. I wonder this morning, have you come to terms with the glory of Jesus? Have you seen that he is the Lord? That he is the Son? That he is the servant, the true servant of people's salvation? That he is the amazing Saviour? Who sees through all the darkness that human beings try to, try to promote in an effort to display their own righteousness, in an effort to try and gain relationship with God, he is breaking through and he has broken through to provide the only way of right relationship with him. Have you recognised the glory, the grace, the truth of Jesus Christ? That will be seen in, in humbly coming and putting your trust only in him as the secure of God's eternal blessing. It will be seen in you wanting to bear witness of him to others, knowing that it's the only place, it's the only person who can provide that for them, regardless of their heritage. And as you keep reading the New Testament, we see, for example, in the book of Ephesians 1-3, to that God's glory is to be manifested now since Jesus has come, in his people who, having been joined to him by faith, are his growing temple, displaying the glory of his grace and truth. So there's a challenge there for us who are Christians as well, isn't it? Uh, are we actually helping point people towards the glory of God's salvation coming Jesus in terms of his church? What is our attitude? To his church. Paul says in Ephesians at the end of chapter 3 that God's glory is being manifested in his church and in Christ Jesus because they cannot be separated. So it's important for us to think about how we're relating to God and expressing that relationship not only in terms of our individual lives what we think of as being so important for ourselves, but also in terms of the community of God's people, among which we should be servants, and we should be seeking the, the highest good, the salvation and sanctification of each one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ you have revealed your glory and you revealed it in the supreme, the final, the full way that you always intended and which could never be revealed prior to the coming of Jesus like that. We thank you that this glory has been manifested in such a way that you have displayed your grace supremely providing a way of salvation which we could never provide ourselves and which by ourselves we would never even seem to provide. We thank you that in Jesus Christ as we began this morning singing we have everything we need for life and godliness, everything we need for right relationship with you, everything needed for the forgiveness of our sins and the promise of sure promise of eternal life. And we thank you that we're able to be witnesses in this world of this light, this life, of the new creation that Jesus has come to provide. Please equip us, please help us to see our lives as lives of service 
promoting and proclaiming your salvation to others. And we pray that many people will truly come to see your glory in the Lord Jesus Christ by putting their trust in him, by serving his kingdom, his mission. And we pray this in his name.